On behalf of Chamber of Commerce, I want to welcome you all for coming. Uh, appreciate very much the attendance. You know, given who's in the audience, I think it's a great group for this panel on the opioid crisis. Uh, we're hosting this today because we're, I think we're all looking for ways that we can help. Uh, I've never seen anything like this in my entire career. We look at the death toll uh, monthly, weekly, monthly, and yearly. It is absolutely staggering. And there are so many different people in the audience today that come from very different perspectives. Our hope is that from the Chamber of Commerce and the business community, we can connect our businesses to help them. We're just not sure what is the best way to do that. So a lot of what we're doing today is trying to listen and learn and then come up with some strategies that we can at least help. I think everybody's been affected somehow. I'll bet everybody's room knows somebody. We all do. I can speak for you know our team and friends, neighbors. It seems like everybody is, is somehow affected by this. And again, looking at drug issues over the years, I've never seen anything uh, like we're dealing with today. And we've assembled a great panel, a great group of speakers. And it's going to be a very interactive session today. It really is. I want to thank Susan George and Michelle Heffern in the corner there from our, our Chamber of Events team for all the work they did. I want to thank our panelists who have meet in a few minutes uh, and the speakers who are here. And these things would not happen without sponsorship. So as we start off today, uh, Avani Technology Solutions is our sponsor. You know, what we're trying to do is do events where they're free on charge. Uh, we can't do that without some sponsorship. And, and Bruno DeVoe, who's uh, a vice president of Avani, is here. Uh, they've been a great supporter of ours, great member. I want to just light Bruno up for a few minutes before we start to say a few words. Bruno. We clap for him. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I know we've got a really action-packed and, and, and full agenda, so I promise to keep this uh, very brief, but uh, Avani Technology Solutions is an information technology company. Uh, proud to say that uh, Rochester is, is our home, our headquarters, uh, the corner of Lee and Lexington. Uh, we provide uh, IT solutions, uh, consulting, and, and products to uh, not only local, but uh, national accounts as well. So uh, keep us in mind if you have any IT needs. Uh, and we're, we're very proud to, uh, to partner with the Chamber in, in sponsoring these trends on, on such topical issues. Um, this one certainly is, and I share with uh, thoughts that Bob conveyed to us that it does impact everyone. And um, Again, we're, uh, we're, we're very happy that you carved time out of your busy schedules, uh, your individuals, as well as the panelists, to, uh, to talk about this important topic. So, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you. I just remember the fact this year at the Business Hall of Fame dinner, uh, Vic Salerno, who was in the audience, I won't embarrass him at the point I had to stand, uh, he was inducted this year. And his acceptance speech was all about the opioid crisis, which I thought was really, it just struck me in terms of the impact that his words had in a very short period of time, which really kind of goes back to my point about the business community looking for solutions. Uh, Monroe County, I'm very proud to say, has been a leader uh, in this effort. I'm very, very proud of the work they have done. Uh, one of our panelists, Dr. Mike Mendoza, you'll meet in a few minutes. Uh, he's been in the chamber on, on several occasions, really helping us to understand the depth of this crisis. But it really starts at the top of leadership, and I just have a, a couple minutes. We have just two speakers. Uh, first, I want to welcome our county executive, Cheryl Denoffel, who's up, who's here. Uh, have her come up and say a few words, and, and really, I want to commend the county executive for her work and her leadership uh, with this effort. Uh, she's been behind us since the start, and she's done a tremendous job. So please welcome our county executive, Cheryl Denoffel. Cheryl. Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you, uh, Bob Duffy, for having us here and gathering us all here together this morning. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, but uh, I just want to say to the people in the audience, um, I am so glad that you're here today. Uh, we have brought this uh, discussion throughout our community, and I want to talk a little bit about why that's so important. But it's equally important, not that we just have panel members who are willing to come in and share information about the opioid epidemic that is ravaging not only Monroe County, the state of New York, but our country. But each and every one of you in the audience really have a very important role to play in helping to address this crisis. You know, we talk about this no matter where you live, doesn't matter what you do for a living, 
Um, everybody knows somebody, the statistics tell us that one in four people have been impacted by the opioid crisis. And by you being here this morning, you know how important this topic is and your role in spreading the message and the awareness about the opi opioid crisis. Um, Dr. Mendoza is really leading the charge, uh, not only here in Monroe County, but in the country. And the opioid leadership role that he has taken is gaining national attention. I want to thank him for being our health director and for being proactive, uh, along with uh, Sheriff Todd Baxter and our district attorney, Sandra Dorley, um, in helping uh, to address this crisis. So Dr. Mendoza, thank you. We've actually gone and, and reached out to over 50 different businesses and schools um, and we're spreading the word. We've trained law enforcement officers, um, first responders on the, the use of Narcan. We're reaching out to businesses to do the same thing. Um, this is an all hands on deck approach from education to treatment and to law enforcement as well. I want you to know that Monroe County will continue to lead the charge because this is a crisis that is hitting every family in our country. It's our sisters, our brothers, our children, it could be our parents, our coworkers. I applaud each and every one of you for being here today. I thank you for your kind attention and for doing your part. And if I may leave you with just one action item. Every time I speak at any, especially at the schools, it's really interesting, and I know that Dr. Mendoza will probably talk about this. One of the ways that this crisis has hit our country was a long time ago with overprescription of narcotics. So, you know, you go to the doctor, you have a knee injury, you want to alleviate the pain, maybe you brought your child there, not you, but others, and you walk away with a bottle of Vicodin. And what happens is at the end of the 50 pills of Vicodin, some people have now become addicted. And that takes you to the streets, and it takes you to heroin, it takes you to fentanyl, it takes you to the end. So what I would ask you as an action item is to go home and check your medicine cabinets. If you have medication, any type of uh, uh, opioid type of medication like a Vicodin, get rid of it. If you don't need it, get rid of it. There's a proper way to dispose of it. You can bring it to any sheriff substation. You can bring it to Wagmans. They're great partners uh, with the county. You can certainly bring it to our eco park uh, on Saturdays or Wednesdays. Um, always available to you. But please check your medicine cabinets and check those of people that you might be responsible for. So maybe our seniors as well, and I'll share the story with you. My dad, who's 89 years old, I went into his cupboard and I said, Dad, what the heck do you have all this medication for? And he has his, and he's got my mom's. And uh, he said, well, I might need it. You never know when it could come in handy. I said, well, you don't need it. So take it out um, because uh, not only are, will our older adults look at that medication, but our younger ones will too. So kids will go into medicine cabinets, they'll take that medication, they'll bring it to parties, and uh, a tragedy can occur. So thank you so much for doing your part. We appreciate it. Thank you to all of our partners who are here from the treatment uh, programs that are, are so wonderful in the county of Monroe. It's going to take each and every one of, uh, of us to get this job done, and I thank you for uh, being leaders in this battle. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Okay, so next up, we're proud to have our district attorney, uh, Sandra Dorley, is here, who uh, has always been a very, very tough prosecutor. It is also someone that really gets this part of the deal as well in terms of the issues with the opioid crisis. So please welcome our DA, Sandra Dorley. Thank you and good morning, everyone. It really is a pleasure to be here and to address you briefly. And briefly is the key word because I could probably stand up here and talk to you forever. But I understand that we have a wonderful panel and I can't wait to hear um, all of the speakers. But just to give you a little perspective from the, the law enforcement or the prosecution aspect, because that's the one part of this, this crisis that I do know. I know the prosecution aspect. And I, I really applaud all of those treatment providers who are in the room because I really, it's a tough job that you have to do. And whatever um, we can do to help you, we are here for that. But this is a growing epidemic. In April, at the end of April of 2018, there were, um, I'm trying to get the exact numbers, 352 overdoses here in Monroe County. 352. 52 of those overdoses were fatal. Last year in Monroe County, we had 144 fatal overdoses and over 750 non-fatal overdoses. And these are numbers that we just began to collect through, through the Monroe Crime Analysis Center. 
we decided that we needed to collect real-time data to address the problem. So all law enforcement gathered together and at the site, the scene of every fatal and non-fatal, we would collect information regarding the victim, regarding the dealers, regarding the packaging, so that we could get together <clears throat> and get this intelligence and go out to the community, arrest the dealers, give help to the victims, and really start to tackle this problem head on. This real-time data has proven essential in our being able to really take the crisis and really identify the victims. In my perspective, you know, I want to take the dealers and I want to take them off the street and I want to put them in state prison for as long as possible. And I want to take the victims, those who are suffering from this poison, and I want to get them the treatment that they need. And it really is walking a fine line. But I think with all of the intelligence that we're gathering, that we can make that identification. We can identify who the dealers are and who are those who really need treatment. Several of our campaigns that we're going forward with um, lately have been the one to prosecute those who sell this poison in our community with homicide charges. You may have seen our billboards, and I have a few of these posters here today. We've had enough. If you deal drugs and someone dies, you're going to prison for homicide. Technically, the law is if you sell some uh, a drug and a person dies, that is not enough to to create or to sustain a homicide charge. But if there are aggravating circumstances, we are able to build solid cases. And we've been doing that. We've had one person plead guilty to criminally negligent homicide. He's going to stay in prison. Another one is going to take a plea on Friday. And since then, we've been able to take two dealers and charge them with manslaughter in the second degree. So we are sending this message to dealers that, you know what? We are not going to stand for this. On the flip side, what are we doing for those who really need to battle this addiction? What are we doing for the victims? We have programs in courts that we, we send victims to all the time, and I mean victims because they're victims of this epidemic. They are the addicts that need help. They come to us and they need to be fulfilled and they need to get help. Also in June, we're going down with law enforcement and we're going to look into something called Project Hope. So those who are arrested, who are arrested um, with low level drug charges, of you know, heroin um, or fentanyl, we're going to give them the opportunity to get into treatment. And if they do that, they won't enter the criminal justice system, so that will prevent them from getting a criminal record. So we have a lot of things to do. So we're balancing it. We're putting the criminals in jail, the dealers in jail, and we're giving help to the treatment providers. So that's, that, those are just some of the things that we're doing. And as the county executive said, this touches home. Everyone in this room is probably affected you know, by this epidemic. You know, it was a couple of days ago, um, and I, t I tell the story, um, someone very near and dear to me, her daughter, died of an overdose, and I had to make the announcement. I had to go and make the notify. I went to her house and told her that her daughter didn't make it. And this is, you know, someone from a good family, and they had done everything they could to give her help, to get her treatment. She had a non-fatal overdose, and she was in the hospital. She was then released to an inpatient treatment facility. She was in there for two weeks and there was no worn handoff. After the inpatient treatment, um, she was released, her parents didn't know, and within 24 hours, she was using again and she was dead. So that is the most important thing. Um, from the perspective of law enforcement, from the perspective of prosecution, it's not the beds, it's the warm handoff, and all of you treatment providers can know that. Once someone goes through that, that detox, they need a peer, they need a hand, they need a support, and that support's not going to be, you know, a week or so. That's a lifetime support, and I think with that, we're going to be able to tackle this case by case, individual by individual. And again, um, the treatment providers, I, I applaud you for all the work that you're doing, but in the meanwhile, I'm going to take these dealers off the street one by one. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank our county executive and our DA for taking time to be your NXG for participating and being part of the program. Uh, next part of the program, very special story coming up next. And when our speaker finishes, I can invite Dan to come up right away. Dan Smith is going to moderate the panel to keep this moving along. Uh, very proud to have from Uther Doyle today, Willie Jean Rounds Dean, uh, who is a counselor at Uther Doyle and also has a great story to tell about her life, her experiences uh, with this issue today. And uh, I think it's the best way to start off uh, this program today is to have story by Willie Jean Pump and share her story. So I want to welcome her up to the audience and, and please welcome Willie Jean around the
Good morning, everybody. Morning. Um, I'm going to start off with um, telling you a little about myself. I'm a recovering addict by the name of Willie Jane Rounds hyphen Dean. And I say that with great gratitude because that's where I'm at today in my life. Um, the other day I was driving down um, by Joseph Avenue and um, I seen a billboard and the billboard said addiction is, an, is a disease and not a choice. And when I read that I actually pulled over so I can read it again. And um, I have to say it's right because it is a choice. You don't have to be there. You choose to be there. And in my story, I chose to be there for so many years. 20 plus years I was out there on drugs. And when I started using, I thought it was fun. I, th I wanted to be a part of. I wanted to hang out with my friends because I thought it was cool. And come to find out, in that process, I owned my own home and I owned two cars. I had a real good job. And I gave it up for the disease of addiction because I didn't know that's what would happen to me at the end of the road. Um, I end up going to a lot of rehabs. And um, for some reason, I must have wasn't ready because doing all that, I would get out of the rehab and I would um, go right back doing the same thing using. Um, when I finally hit rock bottom, I woke up one day and, and I said to my, my sister-in-law, I called her up and I said, you know what? I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't like this. I don't like the way I feel. I don't like the way I look. I have low self-esteem about myself. And, and she said to me, she said, well, what are you using? I said, I'm using everything in the book. And I don't use heroin, but I did, in, you know, a couple of times. Because you try everything, but, and you look at it like this, a drug is a drug. No matter what drug you use, and it still kills you. And I tell you something, I don't wish this on no one. This disease is killing our youth, it's killing our older people, just like it would have killed me if God didn't have other plans for me. And I, I feel strongly that he had a plan for me because he kept me here. And it was many days I wanted to die out there. And, and I couldn't just take my own life because I was too scared to do it. And, you know, a lot of people say, you know, I want to kill myself, I want to kill myself, and they don't do it, they really don't mean it. But I, I prayed many days for him to take my life away because I was just caught up in the grip. And I have to tell you, um, I was facing three years in prison because I was staying in jail more than I was staying out of jail. And sometimes I was glad to go to jail because I was able to get a good meal and, and be warm because it was days out there, it was very cold. It was real cold out there, but you didn't feel that because the disease of addiction had you so caught up that you didn't care how high the snow was. You didn't care how much it rained. You were still out there trying to get that one more. And I was that person, and I'm not ashamed to tell you today that I was out there. I'm not ashamed to let people know where I'm at in my process. And I tell you, when I had my kids, that was one thing I did not do. I did not use with my kids, and that was a blessing. But when I did have them and I was working, I would, I got so bad that I had to use before I went to work. And once you start doing that, you start calling off. And then if you don't call off, you're not just, you're just not going to show. And I lost many jobs because of my de disease of addiction. And I don't want to do that today. And that's why when I went into a facility, I went into Liberty Manor through Catholic Family Center for nine months. And I tell you something, when they told me that I had to move, I totally cried because I had got nine months clean. I was doing good. I started loving myself again. I started feeling like a human being again. And I was like, you're kicking me out? And they was like, well, we're not kicking you out, but we're going to send you to a halfway house. And they sent me to a halfway house, and I stayed there. And then when, they was, when it was time for me to leave from there, I said, I'm not going back out there. There's no way I want to go back out there. And they put me in supportive living. And then I ended up getting an independent living, and I wanted my son back in my life because my kids was caught up in the system because of my disease of addiction. 
question. I was calling myself selling drugs. Huh? How could you sell drugs when you was your best customer? That didn't work out too well. But um, I got into <laughs> CPS. CPS, I, I say today, I, I love CPS today. Back then, I didn't like them. But I love them today because they, they stayed on top of me. They, they helped me. They put me in program. And you think I wanted it? No, I didn't because I wasn't ready to stop. But today, I stand before you and I'm ready to stop, and I did stop. I have 14 years and eight days today, and I tell you, I just celebrated my 14 years last Monday at my home. <laughs> Thank you, and I wanna say, I was so overwhelmed that when I went home, I just started crying. And my husband said to me, why are you crying? I said, I don't know. I said, but I just feel really good about being in this process. I thank God each day, every morning, every night, that he took this disease away from me. And I want to help people like me. And that's why I went into the field of chemical dependency. And I got to say, I worked at... Um, I work at Captain Family Center, and I work at Hugh Tadoa, and I tell you, when I went to Hugh Tadoa to get a job, I have to say, in the 90s, I was a client there. And this just goes to show you that recovery is possible. I was a client there, and I would get in group, and I would talk good talk, and oh, yeah, I, would, I had it all together. And the minute I walked out that door, I went straight to the drugs. I went straight to the drugs. And I wasn't ready for that, so I left. I went for a couple of weeks, and I stopped. And, and in 2004, I surrendered because my daughter came to me, and I, and I thank her to this day. Every day, I love my kids because they gave me tough love. They was there for me when I couldn't be there for myself. And she said to me, she said, you know, I'm going to have a baby, and I would like for you to be a part of this. But you can't be a part of this when you're out there in the street. She said, if you can just, just try to stop, I would do whatever I need to do for you to help you. She said, I would come to the facility, and I would come every weekend and sit with you and, 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 and bring the kids and you know what I had to do that I had to take that in consideration because I want to be a, I wanted to be a grandmother I wanted to be something different than an um, a addict and I'm going to always be an addict but I'm going to be in recovery and I'm going to keep maintaining what I need to do and I did that and sometimes you can't do for yourself but if someone, it can be someone in your life that you love more than you at that time that can help you do what you need to do. And that, those was my grandkids. They helped me through this, and they love their grandmother, no matter if they want money all the time. They still <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, that, that's my, my stepping stone right there that this program, it worked. And we need to help these clients. We need to help the opiates people. I'm not an opiates user, but I, I'm a drug addict. And I'm not going to sit here and brag on that. I hate that I, can, I went down that road. But I tell you something, something good came out of it because I work for an agency now that I can help clients in this process. And each day that I go, I have a group every day. And I'm glad that I have a group every day because I sit in that group and I facilitate that group and I hear these clients' struggles. And they don't know what be going through my mind, but... Lots of times I'll be sitting there saying, you know what, I understand you. I was there too, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to stay in here. We're going to keep having the, the judges, the lawyers, everyone prosecuting the, the drug dealers. I wish you can catch a couple of mines right now. I wish I can catch a couple of mines right now and get my money back. <laughs> but you know what, it is what it is. I, I got to tell you, I love working in the agency I work for because they see something in me. Some, they see something in me sometimes I don't see in myself. And I work with a team, I mean a good team. And I'm not just saying this because they're here. I say this when they're not. And I tell you, 
my disease took me places. I got to be honest with you. It took me places that wasn't safe. I had a place to live, and I choose to go live in an abandoned house and smoke crack in that house and, and watch the rats and roaches walk right in front of me, and I'm looking at them, talking to them like they're human beings. You know, that's some insane stuff. And I just want to say to everybody here that keep doing what you're doing for us because I'm a part of this disease. Keep helping us. We need to help these, these individuals um, go in the right direction. And, you know, the only thing I can say, we have to pray for them. We can't beat them down. You know, when a person have a family member that's in this disease, and they always say to them, oh, um, you're never going to be anything. You're never going to do this. You're going to always be an addict. That's not true. You don't have to be. You can beat this. I, if I can get clean, and I say this all the time to a lot of people, anyone can get clean. Because the things that I did out there wasn't a fun thing. They really wasn't. But today, I live a good life. I'm married. I would be married a year on June 3rd. I was able to pay for my wedding, and it wasn't cheap. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It wasn't cheap, but I was able to do it because I looked at it like this, and I'm saying this in clothing. I look at it like this. If I can give a drug dealer thousands and thousands of dollars, why can't I take that and make something positive for myself and enjoy it? I, I bought a house. I'm a homeowner, again, because the first time I was a homeowner, I gave it to the disease of addiction. I'm not going to give this to the disease of addiction. I'm going to keep this, you know, and I hope that I can help people in this process because when I get my case act, which I'm working on now, I'm going to get me a house to help people like me. And I don't care if I make money off of it. I just want to be able to open that door and say, come in. Are you hungry? Do you need a bath? And I'm going to provide them with towels and, and washcloths. And, and I'm going to do what I need to do to help these people. And it might take me a little while to get it up and running. But before I turn 60, I'm going to have this house. And I'm not far from it. So. You know, I got to get started. But um, I just want to thank you guys for allowing me to come in here and, and share something about this disease. Just hang in here with us and help us to help the people that really is reaching out to us to get the help. And I want to say that with um, great gratitude. Thank you so much. Jean, thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, I'm Dan Smith, Rochester Chamber Communications Director. I'm taking over for Bob. He's dead tired now. I think he was doing some wood chopping and lawn cutting yesterday, so we'll move it on now. I'd like to uh, introduce our first panelist. Dr. Michael Mendoza is Commissioner of Public Health for Monroe County and Associate Professor at the University of Rochester in the Departments of Family Medicine, Public Health Sciences, and Nursing. Bridging his experience leading clinical practice transformation with his passion for systems change to improve population health, Dr. Mendoza joined the health department in April 2016 with the goal of strengthening the connections between clinical medicine and public health in our community. He is board certified in family medicine, and in addition to his responsibilities as commissioner, Dr. Mendoza is an active clinician and educator practicing both ambulatory and inpatient family medicine. Please welcome Dr. Michael Mendoza. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you again for sharing your story. Thank you. um, I don't think anything I could say uh, will uh, match the magnitude of what you shared with us this morning. Um, for me to show slides about uh, addiction being a chronic illness is, is really only a fraction of, of what you shared with us today. So I want to thank you for your, your story, for your, your um, power in, in fighting this illness. Thank you very much. Um, as was just shared with all of you, uh, addiction is an illness, and I want to add to that by saying addiction is a chronic illness. I say that because my dream one day is for addiction to become fully integrated in what we do in medicine. 
Uh, there is no reason we should be looking at addiction any differently than we do cancer, heart disease, hypertension. We want to do everything we can to prevent it, and we want to do everything we can to manage it. I use the word manage uh, uh, intentionally because I don't uh, think we can cure addiction. I don't think we can cure hypertension. Our goal with these chronic illnesses is to manage them and to allow people to live a, a, a life fulfilled with jobs and school and work and families, and, and we want to do that for addiction in the same way that we do for cancer, heart disease, and, and the like. I show this picture because this is not a choice. You know, this is the picture of an individual's brain on the far left uh, who does not use drugs, in the middle, somebody who use co uses cocaine uh, but has not used cocaine for 10 days, and on the far right, the individual of somebody who, uses, uh, who has used cocaine but has not used cocaine for 100 days. Uh, to say it again, this is not a choice. For somebody to say that this is a sign of, of a lack of willpower or a lack of spirituality is just not true. You can't wake up one day and wish this wasn't so. Um, this is an illness in every way that you can think of an illness. And I show that last uh, picture uh, again because uh, I want to underscore that this is a chronic illness. That's 100 days. And if any of you have worked with anybody struggling through addiction, 100 days is a long time. And uh, 100 days is just the start. You know, we want to make sure that we engage these people uh, in support and treatment for the, the rest of their lifetime. The first goal with any chronic illness, of course, is prevention. And I'm going to talk about addiction for right now, and we'll get to overdose in a little bit. But our first goal with any chronic illness is to prevent it. And I'm here to say to you that our work with addiction is far from over. Well, what I'm showing to you here is the prevalence of chronic pain. Chronic pain today uh, strikes 116 million Americans. This number eclipses the numbers for cancer, heart disease, and diabetes combined. Now that's not to say that everybody who's struggling through chronic pain uh, has an addiction, but I say this because these people, in my estimation, are at risk for addiction. And we want to do everything we can to prevent the next epidemic. Uh, you know, my hope is that we'll find our way through this epidemic, hopefully soon, but if we're not careful and if we don't uh, establish an infrastructure today that helps to prevent the next one, then we'll be having the same conversation in, in five or ten years. And this is the picture of, of prevention here in Monroe County. These are the statistics of our youth in high school here in Monroe County who report themselves ever using e-cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, and other uh, substances. Uh, I show this slide not to, again, uh, imply that these individuals have an addiction problem, but rather to imply that, that we need to focus on our young uh, adults because they are at risk. Uh, if you look at alcohol numbers, up to 42% of high school seniors in Monroe County have reported that they've used alcohol in the last month. Uh, upwards of 5% of high school freshmen have used heroin ever. You know, these are individuals who are not necessarily struggling through addiction right now, but they are definitely at risk. And that's why it's so important that we've taken our message out to the schools and school districts to share this message, because the last thing we want is to lose a, another young adult to this crisis. And as has been said before, this is not just a problem in Monroe County. This is a problem that uh, ravages the entire community. Um, these are the opioid-driven uh, ER visit rates by county of residence. And as you can see, Monroe County, 135 per 100,000 people. Um, the rate here in Monroe County is actually uh, among the lower rates. Uh, as you can see, there are, are other counties in our region that suffer through higher rates of ER visits. The vast majority of the uh, problem exists here in Monroe County purely because of population. But when you look at the per capita statistics, um, this is certainly a problem that uh, befalls the entire region. And I show this slide uh, to emphasize that our hospitals have been engaged in this crisis for a long time. You know, there's been a lot of criticism about the hospitals not stepping forward, and I want to uh, get in front of that right now and say to you that the hospitals have been doing their uh, yeoman's effort in trying to get their hands around this problem, and the reality is that this is a problem that me medicine alone will not solve. Um, these data are looking at uh, ER and hospital encounters over the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, due to overdose, opioid dependency, and opioid abuse. Uh, there's been a 432% increase in uh, opioid abuse and dependency visits since 2005, 
and an almost 300% increase in overdose visits since 2005. And these are all hitting uh, the doors of our local emergency departments. And so while the ERs are at the front line of trying to, uh, you know, attack this crisis, the hospitals will not be able to do it alone. And this slide is surprising. This is a looking at addiction over the years, the prevalence of addiction over the years. Uh, and the various lines, you know, you don't need to be able to read. The top line is alcohol. You know, alcohol by far is the most commonly abused uh, substance. But if you look at this from the back of the room, basically what you see is that the prevalence of addiction over the last 15 years has remained constant. And this is surprising to many people, because what we're seeing today in the news and in scientific reports is that this problem is spiraling out of control. The problem of addiction is not spiraling out of control. Addiction is not any more common now than it was 15 years ago. And, and many people find that surprising, and so we'll dig into that right now. The reality is that the crisis right now is overdose. People are dying at epidemic rates from overdose, and that is the crisis that we need to get our arms around today. These are the data from Monroe County. These are the opioid deaths occurring in Monroe County. This is clearly a very different picture than the slide I just showed to you. This is the picture of an epidemic. This is what happens when the, the prevalence of an outcome uh, occurs at a, a rate much faster than would be predicted from the underlying illness. And this is the, the epidemic of overdose. And so we as a community need to get our arms around the overdose epidemic in a very different way than we approach the uh, chronic illness of addiction. I don't need to share with all of you the human toll. As, as Ms. Rounds, uh, Dean, shared that with you just now, but I do want to share with you a little bit of the economic impact. The opioid crisis uh, will uh, have cost the United States $1 trillion since the year 2001, and it's estimated to cost another $500 billion as a country uh, by far away. Children uh, in the United States live with an adult who struggles through addiction, and the vast majority of these kids are under the age of five. Uh, and as we'll uh, be shared with you probably later, the average uh, fatal overdose uh, in this is 35 and a half. And so when you think of what is it that's causing life expectancy to fall in, in the United States, it's premature death at this rate. And so how did we get here? So as I've mentioned, the, the epidemic of overdose is a different problem than the problem of addiction. And I'll say as a physician uh, that it's our fault to some degree. As, as a medical profession, we own the origin of this crisis. We own some of what's going to get us out of this crisis, but we cannot do it alone. Um, you know, to say that it's a simple problem is, is far from the truth. And, and I, every time I hear somebody say, oh, you know, we just need to do this or do that, you know, I think to myself, it's not that simple. But I will say that as a medical community, we uh, started down this slippery slope about 20 years ago when we started calling pain the fifth vital sign. And I hope if you have any voice in any healthcare system with your healthcare provider, uh, do everything you can to eliminate pain as a vital sign. There is nothing vital about pain. Uh, pain is important, but it, it is not a vital sign in the same way that temperature and heart rate uh, are. Mm. But that there we were. You know, we set up this dynamic where pain was the enemy. We had to do everything we could to reduce the pain from a nine to a four, from a three to a one, and that changed prescribing behavior. And the pharmaceutical industry caught on real quick that if we could uh, get more uh, oxycodone out onto the streets, uh, we'll do a better job of reducing pain. You know, we were told uh, in the early 2000s that oxycontin was not.